take away from this event um, an uh, opportunity to become involved, to feel as though you can make a difference in this issue, which can be um, depressing, but touches on so many important issues like mental illness, um, you know, public safety, race, so many different things. And so um, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker. So. Our speaker for tonight is Dr. Chris Supernot. Um, Chris is the, an associate professor of philosophy at the University of New Orleans, where he is the founding director of the Alexis de Tocqueville Project, an academic center for research and programming, focusing on issues at the intersection of ethics, individual freedom, and law. Um, his current projects apply his work in moral and political philosophy to contemporary issues, including criminal justice reform and the ethics of punishment, he is the editor of a newly published collection of essays, Rethinking Punishment in the Era of Mass Incarceration. And he has received a handful of awards for his academic work. They include being recognized by Princeton Review in 2012 as one of the best 300 professors in the United States. And by Cengage Learning as one of their most valuable professors of 2014. Um, so I please join me in welcoming Chris, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Well, thank you all for, for coming out, uh, and thank you to AFF and to Kelly and to the Center for Study of Liberty uh, for having us think about what I think is perhaps the most important public policy issue uh, facing us right now, which is addressing our, our criminal justice system. Um, I'm going to see, can we move this just a little closer? So one of the things that I'm, I want you to do tonight, or I want you to come away from the next 30 minutes or so understanding is where we are now when it comes to issues in criminal justice, when it comes to issues in incarceration. So the numbers, the statistics, who's where they are, how many, why, uh, why we've gotten there, right? Those are the two most important things that I want you to take away from this. Uh, at the end, I'll talk through some solutions, uh, or at least directions for possible solutions. But really, this is an ongoing discussion that has to take place through a variety of parties. And the most important thing that you can do if you want to participate in that discussion is to know facts. Right, to know what the situation is. Um, because as Kelly said, you know, a lot of you, I mean, I, I'm an academic, I joke with my wife who's an attorney, that I get to think about these ideas and don't have to worry about how they apply in the real world. This is one of those ideas, this is one of those topics that affects so many people in the real world. We can have academic discussions about policy and why we should punish and who we should punish, but it's important to remember that there are actually people who are affected by this. Many of you have been touched by this. Um, so let me start by the chart that perhaps most people are aware of, or the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall over something, this will be. <laughs> um, so, so I can make all of these slides available, there is no way that some of you in the back can see this. Um, this is the incarceration chart currently in the United States. Right now we have approximately 2.2 million people locked up. Uh, in the United States, it's just under 1%. Uh, it is, I've got the math here, I'm not, I'm not a mathematician. All right, so 2.3 million people, 0.7% of our population right now is incarcerated, either at the federal, state, or local level. Uh, what's important for you, even if you're in the back, what I hope you can see are the colors. Right, so when we talk about criminal justice reform, we talk about incarceration, normally we think about this on the federal level. This is a national incarceration problem. And it is, right? It is a national problem. Um, when you look at it nationwide, when you look at us compared to other nations, the United States, as many of you know, leads the world in per capita uh, incarceration, or incarceration by population, right? So per 100,000 people, we incarcerate 693 persons. So on this list, we're number two, right? We're below the Seychelles Islands. Uh, the reason why the Seychelles Islands are number one and they have such a high population of incarceration, the Seychelles Islands are off the coast of Africa, 
they agreed with the United Nations to imprison Somali pirates. That's the only reason why the Seychelles Islands are above the United States, because they're holding Somali pirates in their prisons. So the United States leads the world in incarceration. This is not something we want to lead in. Uh, if you want to compare ourselves to other nations that we like to compare ourselves to, you know, the European nations, sorry, I'm in, I'm in your way too for the, uh, this is where we fall. Uh, you know, I, I make the joke right now, this isn't really a joking topic, this is my one joke, which is that we're literally off the chart, right? When you make the chart like that, it can be literally off the chart. Uh, but we incarcerate seven, eight times as many people as the next closest station that we like to compare ourselves to with the United, the United Kingdom. Uh, we incarcerate a lot of people, but the important thing to keep in mind is that this is not, for the most part, at the national level. If we incarcerate, say, 2.3 million people, less than 10% is this yellow section of the pie. Those are the people in our federal prisons. The rest of your 2 million incarcerated people in America are not in federal prisons. They're in state prisons and local jails. What that means is that it's not just that we have, say, one group of laws or one section of laws that govern the country, right? That federal laws. Here are people who violated federal laws. But we have 50 or 51 or 52, depending on how you count, jurisdictions that oversee our state prisons. And if you really want to get into the weeds, right, when you start looking at local jails and county laws and why people are where they are, I, I should have looked this up how many counties are in Mississippi. 82, there, I don't need to look it up when you know, right? 82 separate jurisdictions, different local jails with 82 different sets of rules just in Mississippi. Never mind when you go across the country. And so criminal justice reform, mass incarceration, it's something we like to talk about as a national problem. It is, but it's a national problem because there are so many local problems. And the local problems when you compare, say, cities in Texas, so Austin, right? Austin actually looks more similar to, say, cities like New York City than when you compare, say, states on states. But let's look at the state data because it's important for you at least to see where Mississippi ranks. And like a lot of things, uh, Louisiana, we got you beat on this one. <laughs> Not the top. Not Usually you're the top on bad things or we're, or we're beating you. It's yeah. neck and neck. Mississippi's incarceration rate right now, it's roughly 800 people per 100,000 residents. Right? That's roughly 2% or so right, of your population. Um, what I like to do is put up the incarceration rate for Louisiana, West Virginia, which people like to compare Louisiana and Mississippi to because of economic reasons. It's a northern state, but it has similar economic problems as we do. And then Massachusetts. What you'll notice is that Mississippi, Louisiana, West Virginia, pretty much the same type of chart. Bottom left to top right. Although Mississippi and Louisiana have flattened out recently, which is good. Notice that Massachusetts right, is, is pretty much flat since 1990, which is the start right here. Um, What's important though, when we talk with our students about graphs and numbers, is that it's not so much the line that matters, but the axis, right? The numbers. Because even though West Virginia has the same type of chart as Louisiana and Mississippi, when you compare the four states, Louisiana and Mississippi far, far and away beat out West Virginia and Massachusetts. Massachusetts is looking at 300 people in prison per 100,000. Louisiana and Mississippi are closer to 800, 850. We have three to four times as many people incarcerated in Louisiana and Mississippi as Massachusetts per 100,000 residents. There are lots of reasons for that that we can get into. Uh, I've got 30 minutes, so let's, we can hold that off for a bit. But again, I want you to understand the numbers. We've got a problem here. In Miss if you, let, me, let me step back. If you think that incarcerating this many people is a problem, We've got a problem here in Mississippi. We've got a problem in Louisiana. I say it, I frame it as a hypothetical because I think that's one of the things that we need to think about is why are there so many people being incarcerated? I think the default is, look, mass incarceration is a problem, but it's important to understand why they are there. So how many people are locked up, right? Unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to see the chart in the back. Um, 
But this big section here, can, can you see my green pointer? This section here of state prisons, whoops, which is about a quarter, 25% to 20% of the entire pie, are people who are in state prisons for violent crimes. Up here, it's the same type of deal in the local jails. Violent crime is this large section here. Uh, the next, next large section, I imagine you can guess what that is. Someone want to take a guess? Yeah, drugs, right? So here are your drug offenders over here, right? And your drug, so your, your drug offenders, your violent crimes, and your property crimes make up almost all of your, the people that are in our prisons right now. So if we're thinking about where the reform needs to happen, those are really your three main areas, violent crime, drug offenses, property crime, and how we deal with those three may be and probably should be different. So I've talked about the state prisons, talked about federal prisons. The only thing left on this chart in terms of where we are right now is this orange section of local jails. If you blow up the local jails number, right, we have approximately 700,000 people in our local jails right now throughout the country. 500,000 of those people have not been convicted of a crime. Before you say that, I heard, I heard lots of, there's always a reaction to that. Just because they haven't committed a crime doesn't mean that they're not dangerous. But it's probably a problem that we have 500,000 pe people sitting in local jails who haven't been convicted of a crime. So if you're an attorney in here, any attorneys? No. How is that possible? They may be lying. They may be. So my, my wife's an attorney. My entire family is an attorney. Uh, one of the things that you know is how poor the representation is for people who are accused of crimes, never mind you know, throughout the sentencing phase or in appeals. One of the things that you can make an immediate impact if you're interested or you're an attorney is to help represent some of these people who have been accused or get arrested. Because what happens is they end up in jail, they can't make things like very small bails to get out. Bail reform is an issue. That gets you this number here. The reason I put up all these numbers though is that the most important thing to understand tonight coming out of this is that these individuals are located in different areas Federal prison, state prison, local jails, the reasons they're there are entirely different. There is no silver bullet, no one solution that fixes mass incarceration. There are just so many problems. That's how we've gotten there. It's not so much that we can despair, right? Well, we're not going to be able to fix it with one thing, but rather that there are lots of opportunities for you to get involved depending on, on your position, depending on where you are. So this is where we are, and again, uh, if you want these charts, I can send you this, reach out to Kelly. It's, I mean, the most instructive thing is just understanding where, where people are right now. Um, so that's where we are. And there's a question of how we got there. Uh, have some of you read Michelle Alexander's recent book? So Michelle Alexander, I think, is, is really wonderful. One second. But I think she gets something wrong. I have no idea how to present this in the 30 minutes that, that I had. Uh, Michelle Alexander tells a story in The New Jim Crow about how uh, drug laws started mostly in, in the 90s and through have led to this situation of mass incarceration where drug laws essentially were targeting blacks in America. Uh, there's some of that story that seems accurate. Um, the problem is, is that the vast majority of it, at least when you look at the charts, isn't. Um, and so this is my way of telling you, so John Paff, who is a criminal law professor at Fordham, just came out with Locked In. The first section of this book, I don't know if any of you have read this or seen this. You should, you have. So you know the first, the first 150 pages is a bunch of charts going through what the drug laws did and explaining why they are not directly responsible for what we're seeing that it's a convenient explanation, but it doesn't get at the problem. One of the things that John looks at is the incentives that uh, prosecutors have to put people in jail. Uh, there are also incentives on the sides of people in local government to keep them in jail. So briefly, things like how they count uh, people in terms of the census, 
that when you have people in prison, they count towards the census? And you're better, you're more likely to keep your spot or keep your, your district if you have more people. So there's an incentive to keep people in jail for that reason. Uh, he goes through it. It's worth taking a look at that. Um, some of my research is looking into the economic incentives. Uh, along the same lines of John, when you look at who is being put in jail, uh, it's not so much that I, so I say this as a white guy, look, um, I would love it to be the case that the reason why we have so many people in jail is because we have a lot of racist laws, a lot of racist cops, and a lot of racist judges. It's just, it, and there are those. There are racist laws, there are racist cops, there are racist judges. But if you woke up tomorrow and we were all a shade of tan, right, and we eliminated race overnight, we would still have the incarceration problem that we have right now because there are significant financial incentives to keep people in prison and to find them. It's not the case, as best as I can tell, when you look at the incarceration numbers, that people are in prison uh, due to their race in terms of being black or Hispanic. The reason why they're there is because they're poor. And when you look at the prison numbers, they track more closely with poverty in the state than they do with racial demographics in the state. So when you look at the prison numbers and you look at the bottom, say 20% or 25% in terms of poverty, that's a much better track of prison numbers than when you look at racial demographics in the state. Understanding this criminal justice issue or the incarceration issue as one of economic incentives and not one purely of race is going to get you much better solutions if what you want is to actually solve the problem, which is why I think we're here. So that's a very quick and dirty way of saying, I think Michelle touches on a number of important issues. I don't think a lot of it is right, and in many cases it could be dangerously wrong if it would lead us to create policies that would have unintended negative consequences. But what I encourage all of you to do, if you're interested in this, is to take a look at John's book uh, and take a look at some of the research. I'm happy to send you out there, but there's, I'm not going to just go through the, the charts. It doesn't, you'll have to just trust me on, on this one. And I hate when people do that. But that's why I brought the, the book, and I've never done this before. I brought a book and say, it's in here. But you're more than welcome to take a look at it after as well. So if it's not, again, and I'm not saying that there aren't racist laws, there are. Uh, but if it's not just about, say, drug crimes, and it's not just about targeting certain communities, the question is, what is it? Why are people there? Um, let me skip this. I'll come back to this. Whoops. So here are incar our incarceration rates among the founding NATO members. This is the chart that was just up. If we remove all of the people who have been incarcerated for drug crimes and property crimes, these are not the same thing, right? Generally, drug use is not harming anyone, but perhaps the person's using it. Property crimes can be very serious. I'm not suggesting that, that they're equivalent, but rather to show you the numbers. If we remove all of the drug and property crimes from our prison, we're going to be right there, still number two on the list. Remember, there were three main reasons people are put in prison, drug crimes, property crimes, and violent crimes. Take out all the drug crimes, all the property crimes for people in prison. We're still number two of the nations we like to compare ourselves to. We have a violent crime problem in the country. When you compare us to the rest of the world when it comes to violent crime, and again, I think most of these statistics coming out of South Africa and Brazil are garbage. Uh, you know, I'm not going to trust Brazilian violent crime statistics in terms of assaults. But when you look at the reported statistics, we're number three in the world. We're certainly well above, you know, 372 instances per 100,000. We're certainly well above Germany, which has about half of that. Go down to Sweden, which has about a sixth. Japan, which is even less than that. Again, I'll, I can send you all of these. But we've got a lot of violent crime happening in the country. And the problem is, is that we're a, we're a big country, right? And so when you think about violent crime, it's not that it's located or evenly spread out across the country. It's in certain places. And so, ah, oh, again, OK. These are the, the cities, the most violent cities in the world. Right? And they're the usual suspects. You have Caracas and a bunch of cities you know, in Venezuela, Mexico, Honduras, Honduras, Mexico. You go all the way down. Right? All these cities, with the exception of a couple in South Africa, are located in Central America or North America. 
The United States represents those four dots. The 14th most, this, these are for murders, right? Number 14 in the world for per capita murders is St. Louis. Number 25 is Baltimore. New Orleans, which is half of what it was when I was growing up in the city in the 80s and 90s, we're still number 34 in the world when it comes to murders. When I was growing up in the city, we were closer to roughly 90, right? 110 per 100,000. We, we were fourth or fifth in the world. So my reason for mentioning this is that if you're thinking about mass incarceration, there are some very quick ways to take care of some of these problems. One, if you think, you know, say drug crimes, right? It's probably the case that, that people who are guilty of possession shouldn't be in prison, right? But after that, what do you do? So let me suggest um, some perhaps alternatives. So this, this is the part where of this where I say, okay, I'm gonna put some things up and then we can have a discussion about this. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to tie myself to any of this because part of it is going to depend on a state by state level. Some of this will work in some places, some of it won't. But think about who's in prison uh, and why. Um, if you think that there are too many people in prison and you think that it's an economic sort of suck on the rest of the country, Perhaps you believe, and, and perhaps rightly so, that the only people who should be in prison are people who pose an immediate physical danger to other people. If you don't pose an immediate physical danger to other people, we should find some other way to punish you. That doesn't mean we give you a less severe punishment. It just means we find something else. Uh, and there are other examples throughout the world uh, of alternatives. Uh, caning is effective in certain parts of the world. Now, there's the response I wanted. Right, so when I said that you could be caned, that's not a pleasant experience. I have not been caned. Um, but if you think about it, right, is it better that we cane someone or that we put them in prison for five years or 10 years? The question is, what are we trying to accomplish? Right? And so that's at the core of this, of this issue. Um, so prison only for offenders who pose immediate physical danger to others. If you take that position, you're gonna have to come up with alternatives. What are those alternatives? We can have a discussion about that. Um, one of the things that we do right now is we provide other alternatives. So if you think about the correctional pie in this country, if this color chart here was that color chart I put up before, right? those are all of the people in prison, we have two times as many people, two to three times as many people in prison right now as in prison are on probation and parole. 2.3% of our population in this country are either in prison, on probation, or on parole. That's a really high number. But you may say, look, this is the solution, or part of the solution is put more people on probation. Say, we're gonna give you, uh, you know, something, community service, some type of rules you have to live with. If you violate these rules, we're gonna put you in prison. But it's a, look, we're watching you, you know, it's, it's kind of like dealing with my two-year-old, right? If you do this again, you're gonna go to timeout. You don't like that. That's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So there's an alternative. Again, what I wanna do is present you with alternatives. I don't wanna say this, that, the other alternative, because I wanna leave this open for some discussion. Uh, second alternative, this is one I will actually say that I like. Um, I think that we should look at relatively short initial sentences for people who are guilty of, convicted of all crimes, violent crimes included. All of the data on prison sentences suggest that anything over five years does not deter people any longer than five year sentences do. So we like to sentence people for 20, 30, 40, 50 years for different crimes. You know the stories of the absurd ones, like the guy in New Orleans who was arrested for shoplifting $12 worth of Snickers and they tried to sentence to him for 40 years because of, as a habitual offender, right? That's absurd. But there are a lot of cases that perhaps aren't absurd, right? The person who rapes and murders a small child and perhaps should be sentenced to life. Um, but we need to think about, you know, if we believe that at some point someone who committed a crime at 16, 17, 18 is no longer of the state of mind or in a position where they're going to commit a crime, should we keep them in prison? 
just to send a message to them, just to, to satisfy perhaps our sense of vengeance or something else. Again, if you believe that too many people are incarcerated and you believe that many of them are there because they have committed real crimes and many of those crimes are violent, you've got to figure out what to do with these individuals. And I say that knowing that I, I imagine many of us recognize that we did a lot of stupid things when we were 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, some of us may have committed some of these violent crimes. I don't know the background of all of you, uh, but I imagine that hopefully uh, any of us here that did that have, have now changed. So that's something also to think about. Again, if you think too many people are in prison, what do we do with the people who have been convicted, ugh, can been convicted of violent crimes? Third, uh, we can expand the use of tort law. So one of the things that's an important distinction when you look at the law in this country, you've got criminal law and you have tort law. Tort laws are civil penalties. So if you attacked me, so actually let me use a real example. I'm sure you all saw on the news that Rand Paul was attacked, I mean he was tackled by his neighbor, I guess it was some sort of property dispute, and he broke a couple of ribs. There are a couple of ways that this problem or this issue can be addressed. The first is that you send it through the criminal channels. The police come and arrest the guy, he's prosecuted by the DA, and he's given whatever sentence and he's sent to prison or paid a fine or whatever else. The thing is, is that in this case, and in the case of all real crimes, someone has been harmed. In this case it was Rand Paul, but in any case, someone's been harmed. One of the things you could do is, instead of looking to realize justice through the criminal track, you could look at it through the tort track. Look at it as a civil offense. So if I go and attack you, if I go and punch you in the face, instead of, say, me serving 90 days in prison, maybe it's more appropriate, maybe it's more just for me to pay a fine directly to you, that you can recoup your losses. Um, my friend John Hasnes up at Georgetown has written quite a bit on, on the use of tort law. I think it can be expanded far beyond how we use it. I think that's probably a great solution to a lot of a lot of our challenges. It doesn't solve everything, right? If someone's murdered or someone is raped, it's, you know, it's tough to figure out what the appropriate, say, monetary compensation is for that. Um, but this could help reduce it in certain ways. Uh, and then finally, we can make better use of alternative punishments. So uh, you didn't like caning, but we can come up with other, other things. Uh, there's house arrest, there's probation. I, I, don't I can't read your name tag. You didn't like probation. Uh, but here's the thing, right? Um, this is how policy gets done. Uh, we're all, just by virtue of being here at this event, uh, we all have certain sympathies in terms of the role of the government, the role of the state, how we think laws should be policed. And I imagine if we started polling just ourselves in here, we wouldn't agree on specific policy proposals for all of these things. It becomes an even greater challenge once this expands to people who have fundamental philosophical disagreements about the role of government, the appropriate type or ways of punishment. And so I think the challenge is, if you're gonna take this outside of an academic discussion, the challenge is what it should be done. What are the types of things we can agree to? One of the nice things about this issue of mass incarceration is that it seems to have united the folks on the right and the folks on the left. They both seem to think that this is a serious problem in this country. Great, first start. Now what? What do we do? Um, how am I doing on, on time? That's about where I'm, okay. So what I wanted to do is end with, with that. Uh, and so I don't want you to feel cheated if you came here for like the solution to this really terrible problem. Uh, because unfortunately there isn't one solution. The solution that's going to work, say in Orleans Parish, which is where the city of New Orleans is, is gonna be a very different solution than the solution that's going to work in, pick your favorite county in Mississippi that has an incarceration problem but is rural. Right, we don't put drug people who possess drugs in prison anymore in Orleans Parish. And our jails are full. Sorry, it's not a jail anymore, it's a justice center, right? But that's part of it. Part of it is that the discussion, the language that we use 
needs to change as well. Um, and so I'd love to talk with you further, I and mean, we have time for some discussion uh, about you know, things that you've seen. I know we've got a couple of local politicians here, other people who have sort of intimate connections with the criminal justice system. Thoughts about things that, that might work. And again, you don't have to address the entire pie of the problem. It's here is a specific part of the pie. Here are the people who say are in prison because they're possessing drugs. Maybe they shouldn't be in prison. Let's fight to get them out. Or here are the people who are in prison because they, they've been labeled as habitual offenders because of five separate petty thefts. That person probably shouldn't be in prison. It gets a little bit trickier once you get to, to violent offenders. And let me leave you with, if we're going to make a dent in the mass incarceration problem, yes, the drug offenders, yes, the property crimes, but we've also got to start thinking about what we do with, with the violent offenders. And to that, I think the solution isn't on the back end. Right? There, there's no criminal justice system solution to that. The solution has to be on the front end. We have to understand better why people are committing the crimes, what motivates them to do it, what are the circumstances, and try to prevent that from happening in the, in the first place. So at this point, I'm happy to open it up for, for discussions, questions. Let's, uh, I hate to put Joel on the spot, but not really. Uh, <laughs> Joel serves in the state legislature here, and maybe you can kick us off with discussion, maybe address some of the concerns that you think you may be able to remedy there through the legislature. Yeah, I mean, it's on the spot. But um, <laughs> I, I, I think the first, uh, I guess one, one comment I'd make is, is first of all, any, anytime something goes down, you know, two guys, let's use Rand Paul. Rand Paul and his neighbor have, you know, some ridiculous dispute about whatever. And, but, but our justice system doesn't seem to have any concept of, our goal is to get both of them happy again, where they feel like justice has been done. So we immediately show up with these one-size-fits-all solutions, which is, is the guy going away from two to five years, is it two or five, when the logical thing to do would be to show up and say, Rand, you probably didn't like getting body slammed or whatever happened. You know, what would make it right? I mean, maybe all Rand wants is his neighbor to mow his lawn for the summer, just, you know, just to prove that the other guy was wrong. I mean, they've been having apparently disputes for a while now. I mean, maybe he just wants the guy to do something that will be perceived as humiliating, and then it's all good again. I mean, I don't know. But the point being, we seem to leave out the victim in all this sort of stuff. And so often the victim feels like it was not made right, and they're like, we gave the guy 10 years. And the victim's like, what about me? I got nothing. Like, I, I'm not made whole in any of this. So I, I think a couple observations. One, I think it's a one-size-fits-all system. Second, there's not this delineation between were somebody's rights violated or not, which is a very important distinction. Because did somebody do something that violated the life, the liberty, or the property rights of another human being? If not, the question is, well, why are they, why are they in a cage? Like a cage is supposed to stop them from violating people's life, liberty, and property. But there's a lot of people in cages that didn't violate anyone's rights. And uh, and this this comes up a lot because. Um, when, when, you, when you release an offender, there's a victim notification, which makes sense in the case of like murder that you can't notify the victim because they're not there anymore, so you notify their family. But the question is, well, who do you notify when there was no victim? Well, it begs the question, if there was no victim, <laughs> then why were they in prison? Like, you know, it's kind of, you got to scratch your head on that one because apparently nobody was bothered by the fact that they were there, and, you know, and now they're coming back. So, so I think, I mean, if you ask, um, Maybe I'll close with this. And I asked the question of someone, uh, we toured Parchment you know, a while back. And I was talking to a, a, a senior person there and, uh, and, 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 asked, and asked the question, because uh, I know that the locked in book is heavily disputed of you know, the, what role drug crimes play. But I, I, asked, I asked a person involved in treatment and mental health and all that at uh, Parchment, I said, look, if we have 19,000 people in state prison, what would that number be if you took all crimes, if, if nobody was here for a drug or drug related crime? And before I give you that number, I'll say, so that would, that would include people who um, committed a crime to get money for drugs. That would include crimes committed fighting over turf wars. That would include people, uh, you know, drive-by shootings as people, uh, you know, attempt to terrorize their 
rival drug gang. That would include uh, shootouts that uh, that happen as a result of disputes over money and, and the, the transfer. So you take all that, and then you take out all the people who selling drugs was the most appealing thing they could do in their lack of opportunity and all of that sort of stuff. So, so I asked this person the question, I said, if you take all crimes that never would have happened if you can't trace them back to drug, drug prohibition, what would the prison population be in Mississippi? Again, today it's 19,000. Their answer, without thinking about it, was 5,000. I said, seriously, it would drop from 19,000 to 5,000. And their answer was yes, because when you trace the root cause of all of this, if you go back, now you, keep, you can't stop it as, where, where, where the news always stops it as, drive-by shooting. Like, nobody asked the question like, well, why did somebody drive by and shoot up someone else's house? Like, that's a super important question to ask. And they just assume, like, well, just some, sometimes people shoot up other people's houses. Well, no, they don't. Like, they shoot it up for a reason. And so once you trace all of that back, so much of it traces back to drug policy. And, and the fact that when you cannot adjudicate things in a court system, you will adjudicate them on the street. And when you can't use lawyers, you will use guns. And so anyway. I don't know if that's what you want to dig. But yes, yes. When you put a politician on the spot, that's what you get. Yeah, no, no. And, and we talked before, you know, look, I have no philosophical disagreement with you on that. As far as I'm concerned, uh, real crimes have actual victims. If you can't identify a victim or no victim exists, you know, why are we putting someone in prison? Um, I don't think the numbers are as clear as the corrections officer suggested. One of the challenges is I don't think we know, right? We just don't know how many folks end up being in prison for, for drug-related crimes and how much of it would go away if we say, and there are a lot of things you can do with drugs, right? So you could just legalize everything or you could you know, decriminalize consumption or something. Right? We, we just don't know. It's a really good first step, right? There are a lot of really good first steps. Decriminalizing drug use is, is probably one of them. Let me add this, though, because you are involved in policy. Here's my concern. Here's what I would not want to see. I wouldn't want to see us treating drug use um, with, say, mandatory uh, treatments, right? Because if you believe that one of the reasons why so many people are incarcerated or so many people are under the control of the, of the various types of governments are financial, all you end up doing at that point is shifting the responsibility of taking care of that person from the prisons to these new state treatment facilities. So that's a challenge, but I, I agree with you. I mean, look, that, that's, a, that's a great first step. Uh, but again, it's, it's, not, it's not clear that we make the kind of dent that I think a lot of people would want to make, but that's, I, I would love if we did that. That would be, that would be great, awesome. We're going to open it up. Uh, yeah. Anyone has a comment or question? So, one of my chief concerns with the probation uh, issue that's been raised is that, for instance, in Georgia, I know they've been having some real problems now because probation has been used now a lot of private probation companies that really find people. So, this is really going to attack people because I mean, if you get a parking ticket, if you want to pay a parking ticket, already you're struggling. You're a single person, you're struggling. You might get a few unpaid parking tickets. Now you go before a judge. You've got to be, be on probation for a year, maybe two years, and that's an alternative sentencing program. So if you get behind on that, then they stack it on, and then you can actually end up incarcerated. Okay? Yeah. Because I mean, because that's the alternative. That if you have too many violations against you, that then therefore you can actually be on. Like, like I said, the full disclosure, I've actually been a crime victim here, but you know, at the same time though. I'm still on these discussions that at the forefront where we can find some kind of way forward to actually deal with getting as many people to meet as we can because this is a budgetary issue. You know, we're working with the legislature, we're all dealing with the budget, I mean, all these other kind of things. It's not just this state, it's many other states that deal with the ballooning prison populations and, and for ways to make money off of those people. To, to answer your budgetary shortfall, yeah. you, use, you use probation and, and the court fees on these other kinds of ways to make it for those. And so, so if you couldn't hear them, the question or the point was about probation and, and perhaps the problems with the current approach to probation and how if you're worried about financial incentives, there's a financial incentive from the private companies that operate the probation monitoring to get more people, say, on probation. One of the things I skipped over are, are probation statistics for the various states. Um, so you look at someone like Massachusetts, that big, you remember the Massachusetts graph, that big red Pac-Man right there, those are all the people on probation in Massachusetts. 
if you go through it, you know, we have a ton of people. This is Mississippi, right? You know your prison numbers are high. There are just as many people on probation in Mississippi as there are in prisons and on parole. Ton of people. So if you're worried again about incentives and financial incentives and you're worried about, say, private probation companies perverting the justice system, this is a very, very reasonable concern. Um, and, and so before I, another question, before we get another question, I mean, this is the, the challenge with this issue. Again, I think there are some easy moves. So decriminalizing drug use, really easy first step that, that we should take. The problem is once you start looking into these numbers and you start thinking about how companies or state agencies profit off of various parts of the, the criminal justice system, it, it's almost like you become in this position of despair. Uh, the solution is you've got to find some way to realign the financial incentives. Like, that's the solution to a lot of this. The challenge is how do you do that? And at the same time, one, satisfy constituent concerns, one, desires for safety, desires for vengeance, and then more fundamentally philosophical differences about what we should be doing. And that, that's really the challenge right now. Uh, but really small first steps, I think, are, are the best we can do. So decriminalizing, drug use, providing more resources to, to defense of people who've been accused of crimes so that they're not held in jail when they haven't been charged or convicted. Uh, those are all good first steps, but I mean, it doesn't, it may not sound like a lot, but a couple of those things will make a significant difference. And the indigent defense in New Orleans is based on parking tickets, right? It's based on, it's based on a lot, yeah. I mean, parking, you can end up in, in jail for, and sorry, no, the no, Justice no, Center. No, no, I, I, for, meant, I, meant, I meant in terms of, of actually providing for the public defender service offices based on their funding comes to parking Oh, yeah, there, there is some of that, but you can also end up in prison for not paying your parking tickets, yeah. which is what I thought you were referring to. Yeah, I know that, yes, but I'm, but I'm talking about when you talk about the end of to actually help people who are already in there yeah. who have no representation, and those, those offices are actually stacked right now. A lot of them are in New Orleans. Oh, yeah, New Orleans is an absolute yeah. mess when it comes to yeah. indigent uh, defense. Uh, I mean, this will be a, a, this is a great, ter great as in terrible story. So after Katrina, you know, the prison started filling again, and the significant percentage of people who were put in the, the prison uh, were Hispanic, who were you know, Mexican immigrants who came up here to do work after Katrina. They didn't have anyone in the public defender's office who spoke Spanish. So these folks were sitting in jail uh, and had no idea why they were there, what they were charged with. And now you still have people there who don't understand why they're there because they don't get to meet with a public defender, they don't meet with anyone. Uh, so there, there are steps being taken in New Orleans, but again, this is a, this is a, loca you know, a local problem. And it's like hundreds of local problems. So I'm, I'm really glad you're here tonight because you're able to address some of the local problems, but I know others of you have stakes in your communities as well, either Jackson or elsewhere. You've got to identify what the problem is peculiar to your local situation and then figure out ways to, to address it. If you're, if you're concerned about trying to, to fix what seems to be a significant problem. Others? Maybe one more? Is there anything specifically identifiable uh, Mississippi, Louisiana having in common with how prisoners produce income for the prison? Oh, prison, the prison industries. Uh, yeah, so I, did you guys see the story? It must have been a week or two ago. One of our wonderful sheriffs in Louisiana, we just passed some uh, prison reform that's going to allow a lot of people to get out early who they've deemed to be non, a non-threat. Uh, sheriff in one of our, uh, one of the parishes said something like, well, this is a problem because these people you want to let out are our good workers. And you guys really want people in here to cut the grass and to make the beds and to take care of stuff. So not only do you have people who are doing jobs, so state jobs, right? But you're probably aware that you have a significant percentage of people who volunteer to work for federal prison industries. Um, this is, I'm torn on this one, right? So, so when you're in prison, uh, it's, it doesn't seem to me to be unreasonable to have people work, right? To take care of the prison, to, to clean up, to cook, whatever. Uh, in many cases, the, the prisoners have an option whether they want to do a prison job or whether they want to work for, say, a company like Federal Prison Industries, which is run by the federal government. Uh, when they choose that, they end up getting contracted out to do things like AT&T call centers, 
uh, putting together garments for Victoria's Secret, clean up after the BP oil spill. You can look this up, it's Federal Prison Industries. On their website, what they say, and I find this to be just absolutely appalling, and I, it's, but it's there on the website. They say this is the best known, the, the best known secret in outsourcing, right? It's domestic, they're advertising it as domestic outsourcing. That private companies go and, and work for, or, or recruit or, or hire federal prison industries to provide staff, prisoners, at literally pennies on the dollar. The, the, why I'm torn on this is because, I mean, it, in many ways it's volunteer work, right? So they are volunteering, but they're volunteering for private companies. So if you're worried about unintended consequences or situations that can get corrupted, especially when there are financial incentives involved, that might be one of them. Uh, but that's a, it's, a, it's a tricky issue. But at the very least, we would hope that sheriffs would have the good sense to not come out and say, oh, we shouldn't let these people out because they're our good workers. Like, it suggests a problem with the mentality of how we approach prisoners. Um, you know, I think this is, this is perhaps the biggest issue that a lot of times when we think about prisoners, we think about them, we, we kind of, uh, and I don't want to sound like my lefty faculty colleagues, uh, but we, we other them in a certain way, that they're not part of our population. You know, we think about when we make laws, we're making laws that, you know, well, I'm never going to rape someone, I'm never going to commit armed robbery, we're making laws for other people and we're punishing other people and we're kind of doing it a type of internal exile from our society. But if the goal is at some point, these individuals need to be welcomed back. Then part of it is thinking about, well, one, how do we treat them if we decide that the appropriate punishment is prison? But two, you know, what's the appropriate way of dealing with them just generally? Uh, so this is my way of kind of punting on the, on the work programs because I think that can go both ways. It's, I, I've got this book coming out, uh, it's called Justice Incorporated. Uh, and I've had to change ever since that stupid sheriff made that comment because that was the first time when you look at any news article, anything, that someone in law enforcement publicly said this, this issue about having these people work. You knew they thought it, but they never came out and publicly said it until about a week and a half ago. Um, so it's, it, it's a tough issue. It, it's, and you can see how it can be abused. But, the, but there is a good side to that also, because those who are, are looking to uh, reintegrate into the community, they have a skill now. Uh, they have work experience. Yes. They can bring yes. out and be able to go and find a, a job. But you find in Louisiana is better than Mississippi on that side because Louisiana has better programs for their uh, prisoners than Mississippi does. And because of that, when those guys come out of prison, there's opportunities for them. And something else I noticed, uh, like in Louisiana, somebody coming out of prison, Angola or whatever, if they're coming out, they come out there with a packet telling them what jobs are available to them for felons, where they should go to get employment, how they go get this card, get their ID and, and all those types of things. So they can go work on shipyards or go work offshore. So Louisiana has more um, employability skills training for their inmates than Mississippi does. That's a great point. If you didn't hear it, one of the advantages of, of certain prison work programs would be that they provide real world uh, job development experience. Uh, and they do. Um, you know, and, and so one of the things you could say is, look, you need to find a way to make sure that these people, assuming they're going to be welcomed back into our society, what puts them in the best position uh, for that. Maybe it's job training, maybe it's GED, but it's also on the other side when they get out. If we think that someone is not is is in a position where we're going to let them out of prison so we don't think they're they're a direct harm to someone else then there's a real problem say philosophically if we continue to punish them when they get out of prison uh, but i know i know we have to wrap up but this is a really good example of say unintended consequences so a lot of people have pushed for say ban the box bills uh, but some of you may know what the unintended consequence was when people got those ban the box bills passed. Uh, so in states that passed them where there was a high crime rate among African Americans, 
what people found was that then what employers started doing was discriminating based on names that appeared to be African American names on the job applications. So the problem again is, is you're absolutely right. Absolutely, we need to find ways to, to help train people, help bring them back into our society. We also have to make sure that whatever policies get implemented, and you are, my friend, you are in charge of that. Uh, whatever policies that get implemented don't have unintended consequences. Uh, or we do the best we can to figure out what those might be and, and head them off, because often those end up being worse than the problems we're trying to solve. So, well, thank, you. thank you all. Real quick, um, I just, I, you all saw me pass around the survey. Um, if you have a moment before you go to fill that out, um, well, one, um, that's how I can send you the slides um, if you wanted those. And two, um, we are interested in doing an online discussion. This is our third event we've done on criminal justice. So we've got groups across the country that are interested in this. And um, so we're going to be hoping to do an online discussion, um, just like an hour, one evening, on a topic related to this. So there's an option on the survey. If that's something you might be interested in, then I can reach out to you um, about that. But thank you all so much for coming. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Chris. Thank you all for being here. Well, we try to do an event once a month. This is actually our last event of the year, and I think it's a great event to end with. Uh, Stick around a few more minutes and meet more people. There's more food over here, so let's not let that food go to waste. Uh, and we'll be here a little longer uh, if you want to ask Chris questions. And I know there's some members of the media here, so I don't know if you're open to taking those questions as well. So thank you all for being here.